Well, I, 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 oh, 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 here comes Dan. Dan. Here comes Dan. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the last goodie. Here, here, here. There. You're, you're right to the second <laughs> on time. <laughs> Good, good. It's unlocked. Oh, comes Jim. There's also a seat down here. Yep, there's an empty one down here. Okay, well, welcome to the next session of the History of the Devil. We've been through ideas, ideas of evil in ancient societies. Uh, we talked about sort of um, pre-civilization through in the Egyptian gods and goddesses, uh, uh, Babylonia and Assyria, the uh, uh, Akkadian, and particularly the Persian dualistic religion. Um, ideas of evil in the Old Testament uh, last time, and we saw how their idea of Satan is much different than our idea of Satan. How Satan was, uh, you could say, an officer of the court, God's court, uh, the heavenly prosecutor. Um, today, the devil in intertestamental writings, if you, uh, this is where really a big change happened. We're going to see that today. If you just look at Satan in the Old Testament, Satan really couldn't do much without God's permission in the Old Testament. Uh, look at the book of Job, for example, as we did uh, last week, uh, where um, uh, God, uh, uh, Satan needed God's permission. Satan, the accuser, needed God's permission to inflict anything at all on Job. Um, and then, you know, if you then go to the New Testament, here's the devil tempting Jesus. Well, how, how did that change happen? That's what we're going to look at today. The Lord. Hi, Scott. <laughs> oh, we've got a full house. Oh, yes. That's great. The devil is always interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to. Uh, most of us don't know too much about the intertestamental writings, the, uh, the Jewish writings that were done uh, between the Old and New Testaments. So I'm going to uh, take quite a bit of time today to talk about background, what those were, uh, and uh, uh, many of those are not in. Our Bible, at least the Protestant Bible. I'm going to put up a, uh, a timeline here. I you that. you recognize yeah. that? That's from yeah. from the cross from uh, of course from Crossways International. Yeah. Now this looks very busy, but we're not going to talk about it. We're only going to talk about a little bit of it. Ignore the bottom part, for example. These numbers down here are unit numbers from the crosswaves class, and the pictures connect the timeline with the units in the crossways textbook. So we're not going to talk about that. We're just going to talk about the part from this colored band upward. Uh, first, the colored band along the top describes the ancient empires that controlled the Mediterranean and the Mesopotamian regions, and I'll go through there. Uh, because that, it's, it's very important about how uh, Judaism was influenced by a couple of these empires during this time. If we go all the way over to the extreme uh, top left-hand corner, you see a little bit of pink. That was the ancient Assyrian Empire. Uh, the, um, the Assyrians were defeated by the Babylonians. That's the green, line, the green band there. Um, I'm not going to talk much about the Babylonians. Uh, the important part here is the red band, the Persians. Uh, King Cyrus of Persia defeated the Babylonians in 
539 BCE, and then we have a long period of Persian occupation of that area. That's the red band. Um, the, the, a long period of Persian influence in that area until um, Alexander the Great of Macedonia uh, defeated um, Darius III of Persia in 333 BCE. That's, the, that's this green band here. You notice uh, at the top, that green band is pretty tiny, right? Mm -hmm. Alexander the Great died at a young age. Yeah. He, uh, he must have been a fighter rather than a lover because he didn't leave an heir to the throne. <laughs> yeah. And he left no uh, uh, instructions for succession. So his generals fought over his territory, for control over his territory. The two generals that we're concerned with here that fought over the area of, uh, of, of Palestine, uh, where the Jewish homeland was, were Seleucus based in Syria and Ptolemy based in Egypt. And their descendants, known as the Seleucids and the Ptolemies. Seleucids represented by the yellow band and the Ptolemies represented by the, the blue band at the top. Um, the, um, Seleucids um, eventually gained control of the area of Palestine, and then they themselves were defeated when um, uh, the Roman general uh, Pompey uh, invaded uh, Syria in the year 63 and made Syria a province of the Roman Empire. Uh, that's the top band. Then Rome is, this, is the pink band there. Um, in the center, these black circles give uh, dates of BCE. See here the dividing line. This says BCAD. This is a rather old chart. Today we talk about BCE and CE, before the Common Era and Common Era. So these are dates of uh, BCE. Uh, this band, colored band in the middle, is uh, indicates which um, which uh, uh, empire was in control of the Jewish homeland. <clears throat> so, go back and start over here. This uh, uh, pink and black cross-hatched area indicates the period of the Babylonian exile. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, look up at the top there, the green band up at the top is when Babylonia was uh, in control, dominating the, the region. The period before the Babylonian exile, this was the end of the reign of the kings of Judah. Last few kings are shown here. Um, uh, I won't talk about the, the kings. So uh, after the Babylonian exile, when uh, uh, King Cyrus of Persia uh, defeated the Babylonians, um, the, uh, the Jews were the Jews that wanted to return to their homeland were allowed to do so and even supplied with some resources to rebuild their uh, Jerusalem and the temple. And then there was a, a long period, about 200 years, of um, control of, uh, of the uh, Jewish homeland by um, Persia. And uh, it was a rather benign dictatorship. They were allowed to practice their own religion and... Uh, and uh, there, the Jewish religion, um, there was some influence uh, by the, of the uh, Persian religion on the Jewish religion. Then there was uh, some influence by the Greeks and the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. Um, one thing I need to mention is during the control of the Seleucids, there was one particular very brutal Seleucid ruler, Antiochus IV Epiphanes. Uh, he was insane. I mean, he was really Looney Tunes. Uh, Epiphanes means manifestation. He thought he was the earthly manifestation of the Greek god Zeus. He, he outlawed all Jewish practices. He killed many, executed many Jews who uh, kept with Jewish practices. Uh, things got so bad that eventually a group of Jews revolted, led by uh, three brothers called the Maccabees. You probably heard about the Maccabean revolt. And they, uh, they, they, they revolted and, and 
eventually succeeded in forcing out the Seleucids. Uh, and and um, I'll, I'll get, get to that a, a, little, a little bit later. Um, in, in fact, they, they, they forced out the Seleucids, and in 165 BCE, they uh, uh, rededicated the temple. Um, that is celebrated uh, still today in the festival of Hanukkah, the uh, re re rededication of the temple. Uh, in, uh, when the Roman general Pompey uh, invaded um, for the Roman Empire, uh, then the, uh, the area became the uh, Roman province of Judea, and then the uh, Roman Empire took over. Well, that's the uh, timeline. Influence of these empires. So I'm going to talk about two empires in particular that had an influence on uh, Judaism. Persian. The Persian period was from um, 539 BCE when Cyrus defeated the Babylonians to 333 BCE uh, uh, when uh, Alexander the Great uh, defeated the Persians. King Cyrus allowed Jews to return to their homeland and even uh, now, not, not, not all of them in return. See, the Babylonian exile was uh, about 60 years, which means that the people that were taken into captivity were, had either died or were very old, right? And the people who were born in, in Babylonia, uh, many of them considered that place their home. And um, uh, the second part of the book of Isaiah, Second Isaiah, sometimes called Babylonian Isaiah, uh, spent quite a bit of time in that book trying to convince people to return. Right? He, he talks about, uh, listen, the, the journey will be easy. The mountains will be pulled down to fill up the valleys, and the rough places will be made smooth. You can remember the famous words from uh, Handel's Messiah. You know, that's in the book of Isaiah. Uh, so, <coughs> uh, so some people went back, and some people stayed. Uh, you can, for example, read the book of Esther if you want to read a story about uh, some of the Jews that stayed in the uh, Persian area. Uh, the, um, as, I, as we talked about in the first session, the religion of the Persians was called Zoroastrianism. The Zoroastrianism was a dualistic religion. They had a god of wisdom and light, Ahura Mazda, and a god of darkness and evil, um, Angramanya. And those, the state of the world is the way it is, so they thought, because these two gods were struggling against each other, and it would culminate in an epic battle uh, for the control of the world at the end of time. Uh, this was contrasted with the monotheistic religion of the Israelites at the time, and then, of course, the Jews after the uh, Babylonian exile. But the Persian Zoroastrianism uh, influenced Judaism, and that's one of the things that we, we will see uh, caused a, sort of a, an increase in, in the thinking about Satan. You know, does, does, does both good and evil come from God? Or is there another source of evil? And this Zoroastrian thinking about an evil God, maybe there's something to that, right? So Satan took on a greater role in Jewish philosophy under the influence of Persian Zoroastrianism. Other influence I want to talk about is the Greek slash Seleucid uh, influence uh, from 333 BCE to 165 BCE. Now that 165 date is 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 is, is somewhat arbitrary. I chose the date of the um, rededication of the temple. Actually, the Maccabean uh, uh, victory was more drawn out than that, so that that date is somewhat arbitrary. 
Uh, one of the effects is that Greek became the common language around the Mediterranean coast. Um, many Hebrew scriptures were translated into Greek. I'll, get, I'll, I'll talk a lot more about that in the ne on the next slide. Um, There were Greek-speaking Jews around the Mediterranean coast. With all of the troubles that uh, these empires caused with the Jews, many Jews fled the area. I mean, you talk about the Babylonian exile. Many, of, when the Babylonians uh, succeeded in, 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 in uh, destroying Jerusalem, uh, many of the uh, many Jews fled to Egypt, um, especially the area around Alexandria. Uh, and other places around the Mediterranean. Uh, and so those were Greek-speaking areas, and uh, many Jewish people uh, in, in their daily lives uh, spoke Greek. So uh, there were new Jewish writings composed that were written in Greek rather than in Hebrew or Aramaic. Such as Paul, right? Yeah, well, the New Testament, of course, was, was written in Greek, and if you were an educated uh, an educated Jew, you would know Greek, right? Now, I'm going to be uh, reading some um, some passages from these intertestamental writings, uh, some of which are not included in the Bible. Um, so, how did this happen? Some of them are included in the not in the Protestant Old Testament, but are included in the Catholic Old Testament. Some of them are not included in any Bibles. So how did this happen? I want to talk a little bit about this. Who decided which book would? <laughs> <laughs> let, yeah, let, let, me, let me talk about that. We'll start over, we'll start over on the left-hand side here. There, there were uh, many Hebrew writings and there were Jewish writings in Greek uh, at a, a later time, like I said, during, during this time after the, the Greeks were in control and Greek became the common language around the Mediterranean, especially um, in the area of, of uh, Alexandria and Egypt in particular. Uh, the he Hebrew writings, the, especially the people, the Jews around a Alexandria, wanted a, a copy of the Hebrew writings in the language they spoke daily, Greek. So um, many of the Hebrew writings were translated into Greek. Combined with the writings that were already in Jewish writings that were already in Greek to produce a Greek Bible for the Jews. That was called the Septuagint. Now, in the meantime, the Hebrew canon was established. The Jewish religious authorities decided which books should be included in the Hebrew Bible for Jews to use. Now, one of their criteria criterion was only Hebrew pedigree. So, the Hebrew canon. You know, did everybody know where the word canon comes from? Let me explain that. Um, the Greeks. It's from a Greek word. Greeks used to use long, straight reeds or canes for measuring sticks. So the word canon refers to something that has been measured or tested and proven to be true. Like a saint is canonized, so the life of the saint has been uh, examined and proven to be what they say about the saint is proven to be correct. Uh, books of the, uh, that are in the biblical canon have been examined in some way and proven to be true. So, uh, the Hebrew canon was established. Uh, fewer books than in the Greek Bible, because one of the things that the Hebrew authorities decided was, we can't have any Greek books in the Hebrew Bible. Um, so, fewer books in the Hebrew canon. Um, the first Latin Bible was a translation of the Septuagint, the Greek Bible. That was called the Old Latin uh, Bible. Later on, the, um, 
the Latin, Roman Latin scholar Jerome went back and translated the books of the Septuagint, starting with the Greek and Hebrew writings, translated those to Latin, uh, which uh, is where the, the Vulgate came from, or Versio uh, Vulgata. And that was in use in the Catholic Church for a very long time. <clears throat> now, we get to the Protestant Reformation. At that time, the Protestant authorities decided that the right thing to use for the Protestant Old Testament was exactly what the Jews used for their Bible, the Hebrew canon, right? Which was a fewer number of books than were in the Catholic Old Testament, right? But instead of just taking the Hebrew canon, what they did was they took the Roman Catholic Old Testament and just pulled out everything that was not in the Hebrew Bible. So the Protestant Old Testament has the same content as the Hebrew Bible, but the order of the books is the same as the Roman Catholic Old Testament. And that's how we got to where we are today. Okay? Apocryphal slash deuterocanonical books. So there are books that the Catholic Bible has that, that we don't, and there are books that the uh, Greek Orthodox and, and Russian Orthodox Old Testament has that the, that the Catholic Bible doesn't. It's a complicated story. Um, books that Protestants call apocryphal, Catholics don't because they, it's they're, they're, they're book, those are books that are in the Catholic Old Testament. They call them deuterocanonical. Uh, apocryphal means hidden things. Deuterocanonical means second canon. The books that we have, the books of the Old Testament that we have in common with the Catholics are called um, are called uh, protocanonical, first canon, and deuterocanonical is second canon, according to the Catholics. So different names. Um, Way back, I mentioned the scholar Jerome, he translated uh, the, uh, the Bible into Latin, uh, the, the Vulgate. Uh, he proposed that the apocryphal or deuterocanonical books, according to Catholics, uh, be uh, separated into a separate section between, and placed between the Old and the New Testaments. His bosses flatly rejected that proposal. But, Martin Luther, when he translated the Bible into German, did exactly that. He had a section between the Old and the New Testaments, labeled Apocrypha, and he uh, put a, uh, he said about that section, he said, these are books that will not to be held equal to the Holy Scriptures, nevertheless are useful and good to read. That's a Martin, Martin, quote cool from Martin Luther's uh, German Bible. These are the books of the Apocrypha. Tobit, Judith, additions to the Book of Esther, a word about that. Um, some of the very latest, the last books of the Old Testament, our Old Testament to be written, have both a, a Hebrew and a Greek version. The Greek versions are a little bit, the, there were different versions circulating around, right? So which do you pick, the, the, the Hebrew version or the Greek version? Well, of course, the Protestants picked, the, the, the Jews picked the Hebrew version, and that's what's in the Protestant Old Testament. But in the Catholic Old Testament, that, that uh, version came from the Greek version. So in the Apocrypha, there are additions to the Book of Esther, right? Wisdom of Solomon, Solomon Ecclesiasticus, not to be confused with Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes, or the wisdom of Jesus, son of Sirach. Was there quite a bit of difference between the translation of when they went from, from Jewish to, to Latin? 
Uh, well, of course, there are always... In the book itself, as far as the meanings? Uh, it, 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 there are always little problems in the translation. Some translations are pretty good. Uh, the book of Baruch is uh, in the Catholic Bible. Letter of Jeremiah sometimes appears as Baruch chapter 6. Another book that is larger in the Catholic Bible uh, is the book of Daniel. Uh, there are three sections in there that Protestants don't have. Prayer of Azariah and the Song of the Three Jews. The story of Susanna and Bell the Dragon, Bell and the Dragon, and first, first and second Maccabees. Who's the uh, son of Sirach? Yeah, um, this that book is a uh, is wisdom literature. It's like Proverbs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, 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 it's similar to Proverbs. It's w wisdom literature. What about Thomas? Isn't there an apocryphal book of Thomas? There's a Gospel of Thomas. That's a that's a book that did, that didn't get included in the New Testament. Okay. 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 Yeah. In fact, let me let me say. Um, well, I'll I'll get to that in a, in a little bit. I have some books here, uh, of, of a collection of, of of writings that didn't get included in the Bible. And I think the Gospel of Thomas is probably in this one. This is these are books that didn't include did, didn't get included in the New Testament. Okay, let's talk about pseudepigrapha. That's a twenty dollar word, right? Wow. <laughs> wow. Okay. All right. Okay. Say that three times. Yeah. Pseudepigrapha means a false superscription. Um, what is that? Now. If I were to if if I were to pretend to be somebody else or to write a book that I want to be to want it to sound like it's it, it comes from a, a major authority, one thing I might do is lie about the author. I could pretend it was written by a, a, a famous historical figure to give a false sense of authority. Like I could write a book. And, and claim it was written by George Washington, right? That then people, if people bought into that, they would think, oh, well, this must be a really good book. Right? Well, an example we're going to look at today is Enoch, a famous uh, figure from the book of Genesis. There's a, a collection of Enoch writings that were collected into three separate books, first, second, and third Enoch, uh, that's a part of this. They weren't written by Enoch. There's no way, right? They're part of the pseudepigrapha. This is a collection of two volumes of the pseudepigrapha. Another thing I might do is lie about the title, claim that a work of fiction is actually a work of fact. Example, The Life of Adam and Eve. I'll read from that section. You know, was there really somebody around writing a biography of Adam and Eve? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> That's also in the pseudepigrapha. There, there are reasons why these books are not in the Bible, right? So you're saying that Adam bit the apple and stepped <laughs> 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 oh, He just created all writing. Well, yeah. it, it's an... It, I'll get to it. It's an interesting story. Um, the, uh, Eve wasn't the first one that Adam, that uh, the devil tempted, according to this story. Uh, the devil first tempted the serpent so that the serpent would uh -huh. let the age devil talk through the serpent. Okay, I'll get to that. Get, it's an interesting There's story. There's where the devil comes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, okay. Steve, Steve. So, Steve, it yep. might, it, it, it was probably the case, too, that by the second century BCE, yeah. which was very turbulent and very yeah. difficult, the message of some of these works w were controversial. Yes. Politically, socially controversial. Yes. And you would not want these controversial writings to be attributed to yourself or your community, so there was a, 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 a good reason 
to write them under a false attribution, I think, for the sake of, of not reaping the havoc of the imperial powers yes. uh, within which you were uh, living under their control. Absolutely. As, as is true with most apocalyptic literature, these, these are, these, these, a lot of these books fall into the category of apocalyptic literature. And yes, that's exactly right. And certainly you men mentioned the second century BC. That was the time of that uh, insane character that I mentioned, Antiochus IV mm -hmm. Epiphanes, right? And you didn't want to get on his bad side. <laughs> that was, that, that, that would be fatal. So uh, I'm going to uh, read some sections from uh, First and Second Enoch. So who is this? Why was the, why did they choose Enoch for uh, to claim that he, he wrote the, uh, these books? This goes all the way back to Genesis. He's a, an obscure character in Genesis. Um, Genesis 5, uh, 21, 24. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after the birth of Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, then he was no more because God took him. That last verse is very interesting. And we aren't the only ones who thought it was very interesting. Was Enoch taken directly to heaven by God? That's the interesting question. That gave rise to so many legends about maybe Enoch was taken up to heaven so that God could reveal all of the secrets of heaven to Enoch. And the Enoch writings in the Pseudepigrapha have a lot of supposed visions that Enoch had about these secrets that God revealed to him when he was taken up to heaven. Oh. Right? That's the reason that, that, that these authors used Enoch's name as... Um, well, yeah. he was the one who never died. Is that what his reputation is? He yes, yeah. He didn't die a natural death. Well, that, because of that strange verse... Uh, the, his, the legend was that he didn't die a natural death, that God took him directly up to heaven. But it doesn't actually say that. Just God took him? God, God took him, yeah. Right. Okay. It's all speculation. <laughs> Jubilees. I'm going to read a section from Jubilees. Here I have to, the, the, this is not a, this is not a false name, but the, the, the reason it's called Jubilees is kind of interesting. Um, Jubilees is from the way time is reckoned in this book. The, um, on, in every section in this book, it says, well, at this time, this thing happened. The way the time is given is in years, weeks, and jubilees. Let me explain this. And weeks is not what you think. Mm -hmm. Uh, years, when it says, and when it says weeks, it means weeks of years. That is, a period of seven years, right? Weeks of years. Jubilees is seven weeks of years, in other words, 49 years. You, you get that, right? Years, weeks of years, and seven weeks of years, in other words, 49 years. So years, seven years, 49 years. So it would say something like, in the fifth week, in, in, in the fifth year of the second week wow. of the third jubilee. Wow. <laughs> right? So because, because, yeah, because of the way time is reckoned, uh, it's, it's called the Book of Jubilees. Now, let's get down to it here. That, enough of that's all. There's too much background. You probably didn't want to know that much, but I just I I think this stuff is very interesting. So, 
I had to tell you about it. Thank <laughs> you. So now let's get down to it. Uh, I we talked last last week about the serpent in the garden and how the serpent. It's probably a mistake to look back through Christian lenses and say the serpent in the garden was really the devil. That's an old Hebrew legend, and the serpent was probably a trickster character, like um, leprechauns in uh, Irish legends or uh, Nyssa in uh, Norwegian legends or uh, the coyote in Native American legends. And, I mean, granted, it was a very tragic trick on humanity, but uh, if, if, if the original storytellers back then meant for the serpent to be the devil, it would be the only place in the Old Testament where the devil was portrayed that way. Right? And that's very unlikely. But here in the intertestamental literature, that story gets reinterpreted in light of an evil entity. The serpent is no longer merely a trickster in this reinterpretation. Uh, the serpent is the embodiment of a force of evil working against God. First, the wisdom of Solomon. This is an an apocryphal or a deuterocanonical book. I can use Bible Gateway here for this because it is in the apocrypha, the, in the Roman Catholic Bible. I can't use uh, Bible Gateway for books in the pseudepigrapha because they're not in the Bible, but yeah, here's one that it still is in the Roman Catholic Bible, so I can still use Bible Gateway. I like this site because uh, it's um, it's very easy to put links in PowerPoint presentations. They make you look at ads. It's free to use, but they make you look at ads. <laughs> Is that the devil? <laughs> Some kind of temptation. <laughs> so, uh, Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 2, verses 23 and 24. Uh, for God created us for incorruption and made us in the image of his own eternity, but through an adversary's, Satan's, for an adversary's <laughs> enemy death entered the world, and those who belong to his company experience it. So there's a, an indication that the serpent in the garden was the adversary, the devil. So, yeah, a little bit more clear in the life of Adam and Eve. That blue number two at the end is just for me because, so I can keep these things straight. Second volume, Life of Adam and Eve, chapter 16. It's a short chapter. Oh, this requires some setup. Here in the life of Adam and Eve at this point, uh, Adam is nearing his death from old age. He's ill. And Seth, his son, is asking, why is this happening? You can imagine, Adam was the first human, so he's the first human to get sick and die of old age. So Seth is saying, what's going on here? Right? He's never seen anybody die of old age. And so Adam asks Eve to explain why this is happening, why evil has come into the world and it is causing death by old age. So this is Eve talking to Seth. And the devil spoke to the serpent saying, Rise and come to me and I will tell you something to your advantage. Then the serpent came to him and the devil said to him, I hear you are wiser than all the beasts, so I came to observe you. I found you greater than all the beasts, and they associate with you. But yet you are prostrate to the very least. Why do you eat of the weeds of Adam and not of the fruit of paradise? Rise and come, let us make him to be cast out of paradise through his wife, just as we were cast out through him. The serpent said to him, 
I fear lest the Lord be wrathful to me. The devil said to him, Do not fear, only become my vessel, and I will speak a word through your mouth by which you will be able to deceive him. And now a couple of passages from chapter 17. The devil answered me through the mouth of the servant. This is again Eve speaking. The devil answered me through the mouth of the servant. Serpent, you do well, but you do not eat of every plant. And I said to him, yes, we eat from every plant except one only which is in the midst of paradise, concerning which God commanded us not to eat of it, else you most surely die. So, Eve wasn't the first one the, the devil deceived. The devil deceived the serpent first, according to that uh, uh, passage. Again, a second Enoch, chapter 31, verses 3 through 6. We'll switch books. Second Enoch 31. And this is God speaking. And the devil understood how I wished to create another world so that everything could be subjected to Adam on the earth to rule and reign over it. The devil is of the lowest places, and he will become a demon because he fled from heaven. So Tona, because his name was Satanael. In this way he became different from the angels. His nature did not change, but his thought did, since his consciousness of righteous and sinful things changed, and he became aware of his condemnation and of the sin which he sinned previously, and that is why he thought up the scheme against Adam. In such a form he entered paradise and corrupted Eve. So, quite a change in thinking between the Old Testament and the intertestamental writings, right? Yeah. And the other one, the, the old the, the Intertestament. And the yeah. Yeah. So, now we need to talk about the fallen angels. Another story about the devil and the devil's henchmen. Right? <laughs> There are hints about fallen angels in ancient Hebrew legends and in Old Testament writings. Let's look at a pretty obscure passage in Genesis 6. This is, this is right before the flood. Genesis 6, when people began to multiply on the, face of the, uh, on the face of the ground, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that they were fair, and they took wives for themselves of all that they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in mortals forever, for they are flesh. Their days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God went into the daughters of humans who bore children to them. These were the heroes of old, warriors of renown. Notice in this edition, this, this paragraph is labeled the wickedness of humans. I'm not sure why they titled it this way. It seems that the sons of God were the wicked, wicked ones here. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we'll see in the, uh, in, the, in the readings I'm going to read, that it, in fact, yes, these um, fallen angels were the ones punished by God, not the human beings. So I'm not sure where the, this editor got the, the title, Wickedness of Humans. Uh, this, is often, this, this is problematic, the interpretation of this passage. It's most often uh, interpreted as the breakdown of a divine human boundary. And that's... Um, led to uh, God bringing a flood uh, on, the, on the world. Uh, and then we can read a lot about the fall of the angels in intertestamental literature. I've got several references. Book one. Here we go. First Enoch. 
First Enoch chapter 6. In those days when the children of man had multiplied, it happened that there were born unto them handsome and beautiful daughters. And the angels, the children of heaven, saw them and desired them, and they said to one another, Come, let us choose wives for ourselves from among the daughters of man, and beget us children. And Themyaz, their leader, said unto them, I fear that perhaps you will not consent that this deed should be done, and I alone will become responsible for this great sin. But they all responded to him, Let us all swear an oath, and bind everyone among us by a curse not to abandon this suggestion, but to do the deed. And they all swore together, and bound one another by the curse. And they were all together two hundred, and descended unto Ardos, which is the summit of Hermon. And they called the Mount Armon, for they swore and bound one another by a curse. Moving to chapter 7. And they took wives unto themselves, and every one respectively chose one woman for himself. And they began to go unto them, and they taught them magical medicine, incantations, the cutting of roots, and taught them about plants. And the women became pregnant and gave birth to great giants, whose heights were 300 cubits. These giants compared, yeah, 300 cubits. A cubit is about a foot and a half. And 300 cubits. <laughs> These giants consumed the produce of all the people until the people detested feeding them. So the giants turned against the people in order to eat them. And they began to sin against birds, wild beasts, reptiles, and fish. And their flesh was devoured, the one by the other. And they drank blood. And then the earth brought an accusation against the oppressors. Chapter 10. And then the Lord, and then spoke the Most High, the Great and Holy One, and he set Azurel to the son of Lamech. Bible trivia, you know who the son of Lamech was? Noah. Oh. <laughs> Tell him in my name, hide yourself, and reveal to him the end of what is coming. For the earth and everything will be destroyed, and the deluge is about to come upon all the earth, and all that is in it will be destroyed. Now instruct him in order that he may flee, and his seed will be preserved for all generations. And secondly, the Lord said to Raphael, Bind Azazel, hand and foot, and throw him into the darkness. Remember we heard about Azazel before? Mm -hmm. the, um, the scapegoat, story of the scapegoat, mm -hmm. where the sins of the people were put on a goat and released into the wilderness to Azazel? Right. Here's uh, Azazel again, appear, uh, appears. Uh, uh, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the darkness. And he made a hole in the desert which was in Dudael and cast him there. He threw on top of him rugged and sharp rocks and he covered his face in order that he may not see light and in order that he may be sent into the fire on the great day of judgment and gave life to the earth which the angels have corrupted. And he will proclaim, proclaim life for the earth, that he is giving life to her. And all of the, of the children of the people will not perish through all the secrets of the angels which they taught to their sons. And the whole earth has been corrupted by Azazel's teaching of his own actions and right upon him all sin. I'm not going to read this whole thing. Oh. Skip to the last verse. And in those days they will lead them into the bottom of the fire and in torment in the prison where they will be locked up forever. This seems very alien. Yes, I was just wondering. Yes, right? Uh, what, like Greek, this is very much like Greek myth, where the gods um, yes. took humans and mated with humans and then they had yeah. demigods, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So, well, what was that in? I mean, I, did, I mentioned Persian influence uh, on these people. There quite likely could have been Greek influence right. on these people as, mm -hmm. as well. Right. No, uh, and I, that last verse I read mentions a, a prison. Oh, Second Enoch. Uh, I should read this too. 
Um, but one from the order of archangels deviated together with the division that was under his authority. He thought up the impossible idea that he might place his throne higher than the clouds which are above the earth, and that he might become equal to my power. This is God speaking. And I hurled him out from the height, together with his angels, and he was flying around in the air ceaselessly above the bottomless. So there's a piece of the devil being cast out. <laughs> Jubilees. I'm, I think I'll, in the interest of time, I'll skip reading that. Jubilees has a, uh, has, I'll just explain what that, this is about. Jubilees has a slightly different story about this, in which only nine-tenths of the uh, fallen angels are cast into the pit. One-tenth remain on the earth. There is a reference in the New Testament to the spirits in prison. This will be easy to find because I can use the Bible gateway. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey when God waited patiently in the days of Noah, during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight lives, were saved through water. So the spirits in the prison, if spirits in prison, now you know, what that refers to. Well, I find First Peter to be the most interesting book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we're out of time. And I'm out of material for today. <laughs> <laughs> so, next week, the devil in the New Testament. Thanks for coming. Any questions? We don't have a test on this. No test. No, no test. Yeah, the name of the Egyptian gods and goddesses. Yeah, yeah.